Kata. If you're like Raul, who has faced unending cruelty by his people after defeating the Demon King, you'd naturally be pretty annoyed, right? Take it from Raul, who rejects eternal paradise just to exact revenge against the scumbags who brought his doom, going as far as to torture a princess, make a fool out of the strongest swordsman, and even bring down a horrifying research facility. Sounds pretty exciting, right? Raul would also agree. Join us on this exciting tale of revenge. One warrior basked in the glory of victory, having slain the demon king with his blade and overcoming the hurdles of humanity. The world turned peaceful soon after his victory. However, that was just a delusion. The hero was captured and enslaved, with the royal family gunning after him, as he became their main threat after the defeat of the demon king. A woman of high nobility, the princess herself, was making him suffer the effects of having turned down her hand in marriage. While he was brutally tortured, the hero turned into a completely unrecognizable person, vowing to kill the princess in gruesome ways, vowing to devour the whole of the royal family, destroy everything, and kill all of his traitors. The scene switches to the aftermath of the hero's death, acknowledging that he has already passed on. However, this scene takes place right before he is reborn into the same world. The goddess of love comforts Raoul, knowing that he got betrayed and died in endless agony. Raoul, on the other hand, has a more villainous intent and orders her to resurrect his life so that he can annihilate all of his traitors. Whoa, bro is rejecting heaven for revenge. These guys are done for. One year later, in the kingdom of Kurs, the royal highness is appreciated for her beauty. Even though her maids give her endless praise, the princess is a wretched woman who smacks her servants without disregard. While her maid apologizes, the cruel princess erupts in discontent and unrelenting anger because she feels insulted that they didn't bring her a more beautiful dress. The maids tried to explain that Master Emil gave the dress for the princess's wedding. However, even with that explanation, the princess orders them to come up with a different dress for her to wear instead. She refers to her beaten down servant as an unsightly thing, as if the maid doesn't even fit her presence. Some questionable events started taking place in the name of the princess, as only one month ago, the soldiers who had sworn to protect the kingdom's gates were shown to be eradicated. It was a day where they anticipated no threats, and yet what was left was a pool of blood. Commander Sandler is concerned that even with the investigations of the Royal Order of Chivalry, they haven't found anything significant about the culprit. Oh, yeah, they're about to get smoked. The chivalry's commander Sandler asks Princess Victoria. The princess's beauty enthralls Sandler, who still decides to utter the words of importance. She doesn't want the princess to hold a parade, despite the wake of the massacre that occurred a month ago. Sandler doesn't want anything terrible to happen to the princess, who eerily tells her that if she gets the slightest injury, she will fully banish the order of chivalry by her own hands. Sandler kneels in submission and reminds the princess about the death and defeats of their vigilant gatekeepers. She emphasizes that the order of chivalry has to come up with the worst case scenarios and also reminds her that the leaders of their country have been mysteriously dying thanks to an unknown disease. Sandler believes that they have all been cursed in some regard, but the princess once again mentions that she is uninterested in unsightly things and doesn't really care if more people die. To get her attention, Sandler further explains that the dying people of nobility are all repeating the same words. Their words are to send blessings to the princess, which actually astonishes the princess. Sandler combines the murder case of the gatekeepers and the coincidental threat of sickness as the work of an invisible force that is responsible for taking them down. She begs the princess to postpone the parade until they have taken down the culprit. Even despite those warnings, the princess says that she isn't afraid of anyone, now that the Demon King and the hero have both died. She refuses to show fear and tells Sandler that she has enough shields to protect her in the parade. Sandler questions the meaning of the word shield, to which the callous princess brightly explains that her knights and the people of the country are nothing more than her shields because she is the country's treasure and a special being above all. Damn, she's the definition of the word insufferable. Her words are starting to annoy the knight, who realizes the princess's cruelty. Princess Victoria confirms if she is right about her opinion, to which Sandler can do nothing but agree, that they will be Princess Victoria's shields without question. The scene jumps to the beginning of the parade, where Princess Victoria is lauded and welcomed. Her people sing praises and cheer for her, and she simply takes the backseat to enjoy the wonderful moment. Count Emil Auclair admires the support of the people for Princess Victoria who claims that Emil is nothing more than a fake, 
and that the people are there for her. Emil notes that the beautiful princess is the same in her bitterness. Victoria reflects that she doesn't have any complaints about Emil for being her marriage partner, even though Emil himself is glad to have married her. While he's telling her about his story, Victoria internalizes how she has to bear hearing the words of a fool because of marriage. She finds it all trivial in her ambitions, and her ambitions are to bear a son and have him take the throne in order to completely overcome the country. Princess Victoria is operating in this marriage based on that plan, and thinks that Emil is favorable as a tool in the end. Bro is getting used as a baby trap, poor guy. Princess Victoria is already ready to end her son's life, if he is born ugly for some reason, but she thinks that won't come to pass, since Emil is mostly praised for his face. Victoria still prefers the looks of the fallen hero Raoul, and regrets that he doesn't get to be the one. Yeah, well, this woman is certified crazy. She recalls the time Raoul submitted himself to the throne, vowing to defeat the demon king as the hero. He was a simple and kind-hearted person, a foolish man in Victoria's eyes. However, she was always struck by his determined gaze and wanted to tarnish the truthfulness of those eyes. Princess Victoria admits that he was her favorite and regrets that his death came too harsh and too soon. She admits to driving Raoul to death by her means and is able to see his face of despair before death. To this day, Victoria wonders why Raoul refused her hand in marriage. Commander Sandler and her royal order of chivalry present themselves in the parade, donning their majestic armor. The people of the country admire both the princess and her men. Princess Victoria acknowledges the worth of her shields and decides to bless them with a welcome greeting. The softness of her smile alone leaves the crowd roaring for her name. Princess Victoria enjoys the weight of the applause and is accompanied by delusions of grandeur. Victoria thinks that the world is entitled to her and that she will take control over every single thing, even if she can't control Raoul the hero. Yikes, this girl has more pride and arrogance than Vajita. The priests are called to the stage to bless both of them at the wedding. They chant the blessed words that were promised to the princess, signifying the hopes of a long and happy marriage. Victoria is anticipating the words she told the priests to say to her. The priests refer to Princess Victoria as a heaven-sent child, much to her entertainment. Victoria is waiting for the moment they announce the days of her glory. However, things go wrong. Displaying an eerie smile under the veil, one of the priests utters the same words that all of the cursed royals sang before their deaths. Those words paralyze Victoria, and she looks up, getting her face splashed in splatters of blood. One of the priest's bodies begins to slash apart, and she spouts the same cursed words, before submitting to a terrifying death. Princess Victoria's uneasiness takes over her and fixates on the second priest. The man unveils himself, revealing black hair and the same blazing red eyes from before, standing before the princess in the flesh and greeting her with a surprise. Princess Victoria stutters in both fear and confusion, questioning how it is even possible for the man to be alive. Raoul emphasizes that he has resurrected from the deepest depths of hell, all for the sake of a haunting vengeance, to kill the traitors. That's a badass entrance, if I've seen one. The scene cuts to Raoul's time with the goddess of love, who is begging to be scolded for not being of use to Raoul at the time of his passing. Raoul Evans met the girl before his inevitable reincarnation and remembers his ambitions of bringing peace and salvation to the world with his blade. However, he has long forgotten all of those words and is motivated by the fact that the goddess of love is supporting her. Raoul questions if the situation occurred because the gods expected it to. The goddess of love sobs to explain that they certainly did not expect the humans to kill their very own savior. Raoul grabs her by the jaw and intently reminds her about the true nature of human beings, which far surpasses the fate that the gods foresaw for him as a savior. Yo, he basically called the gods stupid. She apologizes to Raoul for making a mistake in their judgment and tells Raoul that she has sworn her love to him. Raoul thinks nothing of it while the goddess of love claims that he boasts a fearless glare with powers that could very well dominate the entire world, if he ever needed it. That is the reason she deems him precious, and that is also the reason Raoul decides to use her for his own will. Raoul demands that she lend some of her powers, ordering her to resurrect him in the world, so that he can wipe out the traitors. The goddess of love is alarmed and expresses her concern that a cleansed spirit must not return to the ground, along with the fact that her position is at risk of being taken away. Raoul emphasizes his disinterest in the ways of the gods and drives her further into a dilemma, even blackmailing the goddess for not showing her love. Raoul orders her to do the task, and she willingly accepts his will. 
In his mind, Raoul knows that the gods and the traitors shared roles in his demise, and he wants to correct that. Raoul reminds the goddess that he had to survive misery for their sake. Imagine risking your entire life to save humanity, only to get stepped on and betrayed. Claiming that he has desires of his own, Raoul orders the goddess to unseal his powers. The goddess tells him that she can't undo the power of darkness, which only thrives in death and destruction. She thinks that Raoul's soul is at risk of being consumed by the darkness. However, Raoul doesn't care because he has ceased the status of being human the moment everything is taken away from him. The goddess of love tries to persuade him by offering him a place together in eternal paradise. Raoul explains that as a savior, he wants to grant salvation in the world, that the wrath of demons has infested. He wants to kill them and cleanse the planet with his powers. The goddess of love is shocked that he is willing to take the path of carnage for his cause. Raoul confirms and declares that he will purge this world. Even though he is speaking of the darkness, the goddess of love finds Raoul just as elegant. My guy is not only about to start his villain arc, he has also managed to raise a goddess. Raoul orders her to grant him his wish. Sharing a final kiss, the goddess of love unlocks Raoul's powers of darkness. Raoul then demands that she revive him at once, to which the goddess feels saddened, and blesses him on his return to the ground. Raoul receives her blessings and is told to mark his name in the beginning of a new legend. With eyes thriving in determination, Raoul returns to the planet and declares that he will purge this world. In fact, he is the evil curse, the one who showed up to the gatekeepers of the kingdom a month before the wedding ceremony. Raoul became fascinated to hear of the princess's wedding. Returning to the present moment, Raoul basks in the glory of his accomplishments ever since he was reincarnated. He sees the stunned reaction of Princess Victoria, who experiences disgust with blood covering her body. Raoul had made long preparations for this day and laughed in her face for thinking of other people below her. He is the only one who sees completely through her, knowing her real face beneath the one of royalty. Commander Sandler jumps to protect the princess, declaring that the demon before them has taken over the appearance of their fallen hero. Raoul is offended that he is being accused of killing another priest, and reveals that the priests are equally corrupted for making wrongful convictions that lead to the executions of others. He questions Sandler if she is aware of the horrors that came as a consequence. Sandler demands the demon to unveil its true form, while Raoul casually affirms that he is in his true form. Princess Victoria is startled and calls him a liar, as he shouldn't even be alive. Raoul is bored by her words and thinks that he should adopt a different approach. Raoul blitzes past Commander Sandler and grabs Victoria by her hair, asking her to take a closer look for a good inspection. Commander Sandler orders him to release Victoria, as if that is going to help her case. Raoul mocks Sandler forever, believing that her knights would be of use against him. Sandler succumbs to the horrifying realization that all five of her knights have been decapitated in an instant. The gruesome end of the knights strikes fear in the hearts of the citizens, who run away for their own sake. Raoul finds it adorable that Victoria's subjects are fighting with each other for escape, and casually tells all of them to pay attention. Raoul emphasizes that the show has just begun, and he needs his spectators to watch until the end. Mockingly displaying Victoria's body to the world, Raoul finds pleasure in presenting the show that stars the princess herself. No, this is what happens when you get on the wrong side of the hero. Raoul notes that these people love watching entertaining shows just like this spectacle. The people are worried for their own sake, which only continues to amuse Raoul. Suddenly, Victoria roars in anger, mocking her people for panicking without reason. She tells them that she does not fear the one who is posing as their fallen hero, and she wears a peculiar smile as if she is proud of it. Raoul tells her that he is no monster and emphasizes that he has been reborn into this world, a reality that she should accept. Commander Sandler is told to kill the monster that has seized the princess. However, Sandler tells the princess that Raoul's magic has frozen her legs into place. Victoria straight up orders her to chop off her legs if it means having to save the princess's life. Sandler is struck with unending bafflement by her words. Raoul is enjoying the show and tells Sandler not to intervene because she is influencing the stage. Sandler barks at him and tells Raoul that she will stop him from hurting the princess. Raoul reflects that Sandler is nothing more than a straight-laced knight. He toys with the princess and looks towards the frightened Emil, who has actually pissed his pants out of fear. Raoul wants to preserve the theme of the parade, that being the marriage announcement, and explains that the couple should come together as a duet. Using telekinesis magic, he forces his body onto her. Count Emil whines and whines like a little boy who is lost. Victoria gets even more offended 
while Raoul is busy having the laughter of his life. Emil endlessly calls for his mother, showing more fear than even the princess. Sandler once again demands Raoul to free the princess from his shackles. Raoul tells her that he has ensured all of the actors are in place for his show. He turns to Victoria, questioning why she isn't wearing the original white dress on the day of the marriage announcement. He furthers that the color of blood wouldn't go well with her red dress. Saying those words, Raoul rips apart her dress while Victoria growls to question his intentions. Raoul reminds the princess that she has always wanted to bear children, which is why he has prepared the main event for her. Victoria howls in disagreement as her body is sacred and shouldn't be handled by scum. She even threatens to recreate the experience that led to the agonizing death of Raoul. Raoul doesn't feel the least bit threatened and is glad that she has finally accepted him as the original hero. She orders him to kneel, a funny word that Raoul mocks, considering her situation. Sandler shouts at Raoul, commanding him to fight the knights honorably instead of taking the princess as a hostage. However, these are the words that actually annoy him. Raoul questions her meaning of fighting honorably and wonders if Sandler has forgotten the ways they used to capture him. This guy has seen some real crap go down his life that he didn't deserve, all power to him. The scene returns to the past, right before the Demon King's subjugation. The hero is having a pleasant time sharing a good life with the villagers and his party. He cherishes the faces of the children, who hope for his victory and the Demon King's subjugation. The hero vows to return to the village upon the monster's defeat. Yet, when he had completed his important mission, Sandler and her order of chivalry were summoned before the princess to report the matter. Without hesitation, Princess Victoria ordered her men to capture Raoul at once and especially invade the village that Raoul treasured the most. Sandler objected to the idea of taking the villagers hostage, but the wretched and violent princess ordered her knights to brutally kill every single villager. She wanted them to skewer and make a presentable example of even the women and the children. Spouting those deceitful words, Princess Victoria relished the face of despair Raoul would make upon his return. Yeah, write all princess in the comments because she deserves it. When the hero Raoul returned to his village, he was traumatized to bear witness to the demise of the village. He saw the lifeless body of the same boy who wished him farewell in his mission. While he was paralyzed in place, the so-called chivalrous knights captured him. And now, Raoul reminds Sandler that he only eradicated her guards as a tribute to their fateful occasion. Sandler reasons that it wasn't her fault, or a crime is a knight of the princess. She tells him that she was following another's will without questioning it, and deems it righteous to commit a massacre of people, all in the name of justice. Sandler shouts that the orders for the princess reign supreme, as all other lives are trash, going as far as to state that the villagers were tools that died for the sake of the princess. What Sandler noticed far too late is that Raoul amplified her voice thanks to his magic, so that it could ring loud and clear into the ears of the spectators. He thanked Sandler for confessing the absolute truth and emphasized that the true face of the princess had been finally brought to light. Bro used her as a confessing witness, El Mao. With Sandler's confession, the people began bickering about the princess and realized that the crime they pinned on the hero was wrongful persecution. Princess Victoria howls at Sandra for stupidly exposing her, but Raoul wants to have even more fun and uses Sandler's body to deliver a crushing punch to Victoria's face. With broken teeth and a face full of red, Victoria can barely communicate her words because her pretty face has all been ruined. Sandler cries, knowing that the force of magic is manipulating her body, while Raoul sheds tears of joy because he's enjoying the situation. Raoul forces Sandler to knock the princess left and right, until she is a pulped up and bloodied mess. Now that he has prolonged her suffering, Raoul wants to step towards the finale. Drawing near her ruined face, Raoul declares that the princess is going to atone for the sin of murdering his sister. Okay, this princess is officially the worst. Like this video if you agree. The scene jumps to the past, before the subjugation of the Demon King. Raoul was worried sick about her sister, who was soon to deliver a baby. Her sister's smile was everything to Raoul, and even then, he playfully exchanged wits with his sister. Raoul was hoping to see the precious child after his return, while her sister anticipated his fruitful return. Receiving a loving show of affection, Raoul left his sister's place as they prayed for him with divine protection. Despite their blessings, Raoul was eventually captured and enslaved by the princess, who was delighted to question how he was feeling. She didn't know he could be captured so easily, while Raoul questioned the offense that he committed for being captured. Releasing an evil smile, Victoria emphasized that Raoul's existence in this world is his crime, as they only needed his powers to defeat the Demon King. 
She doesn't think of him as anything with the defeat of their nemesis, and believes that it only fits useless things to be thrown into the trash. At the time, Raoul innocently questioned why the princess had to devise such torturous means to murder the innocent people of the village. The princess corrected him, reminding the hero that it was he who burned down the village, as if to imply that the world would know his crime as such. She toyed with Raoul, offering him to become her own. In contrast to her words, Raoul displayed eyes of hatred, which only fueled Victoria to prolong his pain. She ordered Sandler to take Raoul away, wanting to give him a show he will never forget. One could only expect what followed suit, as Raoul was taken to the church, where his eyes met the sight of a treasured beloved one, someone that he was looking most forward to meeting. This is what he meant by having her atone for her sins. Raoul uses his magic, and renders an unrelenting amount of pain upon the princess's body. He forcibly suppresses his anger just to prolong her torture, declaring that her betrayal has been brought into the light. Victoria collapses to the ground, pouring blood and screaming in intense agony. Raoul is there to take pleasure in her demise and advises her not to scream as it would only lead to excessive bleeding. He stops the bleeding on purpose, reminding her that a death too quick would be boring. Raoul questions if the princess feels hurt, as he has taken away the pain. Victoria shouts at him past her broken teeth, openly calling Raoul a pawn that she exploited in the past. Raoul mocks her and reminds the princess that he is only helping them reap the consequences of their actions. In fact, he has only copied them in their schemes up to this very moment. He turns to the chivalrous knights and reminds them that they will receive a similar agonizing death, as if to say he hasn't forgotten about them. Returning to Victoria, Raoul confirms that his show for today has taken its end. He congratulates his brilliant actors for following along, while they are horrified in place. Princess Victoria orders her knights to kill the defiled one, if they want to escape punishment from her wrath. Pleased, Raoul comments how she is still howling despite her troubles. The royal order of chivalry musters a spirit to attack for the sake of their princess. In fact, they are able to impale Raoul's body with two of their blades. Victoria finds herself in utter delight, because she thinks that she has gotten the upper hand. She tells him that this is the result of opposing her will, and that she will kill him. Before she is able to finish her tantrum, Raoul shrugs off the attack, reminding Victoria that the hero is incapable of being killed by mere blades. Victoria's face grows to shock with a tinge of horror, witnessing Raoul casually take out the blades from his body. Yo, this guy let himself get hit to prove a point. He points the bloodied blade right at her neck, reminding the princess that he will return to torture her once she has recovered her face. Saying those words, Raoul turns to leave, bidding them a happy farewell. Before he leaves, Raoul turns to Victoria with a smile and congratulates her on having a wonderful wedding, only to be met by Victoria's face of fear and disgust. With the perfect words, he marks the end of this sequence by blessing the princess. My goodness, the dude gave us a performance to remember. Raoul returns to the church of his fallen sister, apologizing for being so late. He greets her with flowers and then proceeds to engulf the entirety of the church in flames of hellfire, refusing to return a second time. Among the flames, Raoul sees his sister and shows a human side to himself, before referring to himself as a hilarious man, for being able to see ghosts. Raoul admits that only a mind filled with insanity can properly execute the desires of revenge. He tells his sister about the demise of the royal capital and that the people are rebelling against the princess for her deeds. Raoul is happy to mention that the princess followers are fearing for their lives while he is being hunted on the side. Raoul is aware that a dozen healers are currently aiding Victoria's state, but he knows that she won't be able to recover her belly. Raoul also mentions that he cast a giant barrier around the royal capital, ensuring that no one would be able to escape from his wrath. He has also executed the defiled scum, who became responsible for double-crossing his sister. Raoul finds it fascinating that he was able to disguise himself as a priest and caught Victoria off guard. He comments that Victoria's face was a masterpiece of his brilliant strategy. Let's put her face in a museum now, lol. The priest's name was Gustav, and he lived in a hefty mansion, thanks to the money he got from the capital for his betrayal. Gustav was stunned to see a living, breathing Raoul before him. At first, Raoul ensures his demise by revealing his true nature. When Gustav was cowering in fear to persuade Raoul, he casually proceeded to kill him after his admission, with the same torture method that Gustav loved. Raoul shares that he isn't acting out of revenge for his sister alone, but rather for the pure sake of having revenge, as he has no place for justice in his heart. Raoul declares that he will endlessly massacre each of the people who cross him, without showing any form of mercy to anyone. 
Bidding his sister with a final farewell, Raoul walks ahead of the flames as a monstrous force, ready to initiate the second act of his show. Bro is the definition of the quote, you either die a hero or live long enough to become a villain. Back at the royal castle, Princess Victoria has Sandler chained and brutally tortured for not being able to protect her. Victoria questions why Sandler didn't bother severing her legs to protect her. Sandler apologizes to her, an apology that Victoria deems worthless compared to her. She bashes Sandler with endless brutality and demands her to remain silent as she has been unable to leave the castle or kill people for her whims. Victoria's wretchedness still doesn't know any end and she commands her men to torture Sandler while she is away. Her knights reason that the hero's magic must be the cause for her demise. Victoria issues an order to capture Raoul at once and only retrieve his head. After the supreme beating she got, I'm surprised she still gets to say that. Probably the most impressive thing about her. Victoria sent out a secret messenger to an ally, who was once capable of rivaling the hero. However, the messenger is attacked by a bunch of goblins. He knows that he is running out of time and stands to face the goblins. However, what he doesn't know is that the Goblin King is also there to welcome him in battle. The Goblin King is about to obliterate his body to a million pieces when one man arrives to save him. The warrior advises the messenger to stay behind and massacres the goblins with his blade in a single instant. The messenger recognizes this man as the greatest swordsman in the entire country. The swordsman smiles and expresses that he is glad that the messenger won't become prey to the goblins. Nah, something about this guy doesn't feel right to me. After receiving his message, the swordsman shares a meal with his family and tells them that he has to depart for the royal capital to take down the resurrected and fabled Raoul. The swordsman is surprised that even his children are aware of his mission and claims that he has been tasked with the responsibility of subjugating the hero. His children are impressed and even say that he should slay the hero with horrifying means. The swordsman tells his children that he will be bringing home a new toy for them to play with. These gremlins are creepy as heck, dude. The swordsman is delivered a message by one of his servants inquiring what they should cook for the messenger. The swordsman tells his servants that the man already departed for the royal capital, so there is no need for a meal. Finally, one of his maids presents him with his most anticipated meal. The swordsman has been waiting for his savory delight and welcomes the aroma. He stares at his meal and thinks that it is the perfect delicacy before entering battle. The swordsman's children want to take a bite out of it as well, but he reminds them that they must hunt for their meal as he did today. Here is the horrifying part. It is implied that he hunted down the messenger and expressed much pleasure as he took a bite out of the dish, enjoying it as a celebration of his victory. Okay, message received. The humans in this manga are worse than demons, WTF. The following day, the man prepares his horse and heads off to the royal capital. Both Adam and Connie wish for their father to return, with the head of the hero. As he has departed, they want to try practicing hunting with a new toy. The scene switches to a gruesome hunting sport, where both Adam and Connie are enjoying torturing kobolds. They are grateful that their father is going to bring them a new monster as their toy. The little furball has found itself unlucky at the hands of these gremlins. They want to kill him at once while it is escaping and manage to strike it down. Adam and Connie somehow manage to stop the creature from running away with their attacks. As it is about to die, they enjoy the thought of delivering the final blow. However, a towering man appears behind them with a smile, calling them a bunch of brats. Excited, Raoul wants some fun in the show. Nah, to be honest, he seems less evil than these guys. A month before the wedding parade, Raoul was surrounded by the gatekeepers while he was having fun. The gatekeepers couldn't comprehend the reality before them and wondered if he was some kind of ghost. The delighted hero was more than happy to test the extent of his powers on each of the gatekeepers. He began the event of their demise by brutally killing every single one of the men with his powers. Raoul expresses much interest in violating them in the most brutal ways possible and doesn't mind being called a heretic. He decorates them on spikes and thinks that is the perfect display. Under the nice weather, Raoul hears the whines of the children he has just captured. Adam and Connie threaten him with the wrath of their father, reminding him that they're the sons of General Brown. Raoul questions if they are interested in digging holes with the rest of the men. He's making them carry out this task for something later. Raoul tells Adam and Connie to rest assured, as he has prepared a part for them. Raoul was informed that they had found the object. He went to the site and discovered the skeletal remains. He congratulated Enrico on being the best at bone digging and in the lead. Enrico realized that Raoul was interested in even more and ordered him to dig for the sake of all the people who were murdered in General Brown's castle. 
He even spots the body of the freshly killed messenger, which is the evidence that Raoul needs. Raoul reflects that each one of these victims had their tongues cut off and inquires Enrico if General Brown ate the meat of the messenger yesterday. Enrico lies at first, but Raoul knows the truth. He knows that each of General Brown's staff made an awful lot of money ripping these people apart. He's not surprised that Brown's servants are involved in the corruption. Adam and Connie laugh at him for thinking that he has gotten the upper hand because they are confident in their father. Raoul is impressed that the kids are still confident. While he is busy with them, General Brown's wife is preparing a surprise attack from behind and has already issued an order for General Brown's return. She knows that her poisonous arrow is potent enough to destroy a goblin king and thinks that Raoul will become their main dish for the night. Confidence 1000, Execution 0 When she releases the arrow, both Adam and Connie become happy, knowing that they won't even need their father for the demise of the scum. However, Raoul is not worried one bit, especially when the arrow merely bounces back from his head and is deflected in her direction. Before she is able to even comprehend what occurred, the woman is shot with her children, wailing in agony. Raoul is interested in giving the children a special role that he promised them a while ago, and sees the mother who is succumbing to the agonizing poison and meeting her doom. Adam and Connie beg for their mother, and he turns to them and explains that it is time for them to fulfill their duties before General Brown returns. General Brown, on the other hand, is startled by a show of bright light as they come to witness the same body of the deceased messenger that they killed. The illuminated being strikes them as a ghost as he relays to them that the hero and Brown's children are waiting for him. General Brown panics upon hearing this revelation. Raoul thinks that it only serves right for the murderers to meet this fate. He states that dark magic is convenient as it allows him to see someone's past. With this magic, he hears their true voices of defiled evil. Raoul eerily acknowledges the true nature of human beings. He knows that these commoners are the same people that he considered weaklings and protected, risking his life to save them. And yet, in their hearts, there was an evil that had completely spoiled their souls at the expense of others. Yup, these guys are the scum of the earth. Raoul thinks that he is naive, not knowing the true nature of humans beforehand. He thought that they had committed evil deeds on behalf of the demons and knew that they were being dealt this fate because of their master. General Brown, with indescribable anger, makes his appearance before Raoul. The hero, Raoul, isn't concerned and welcomes the general to the scene that he has decorated for him. With his wife marked to the tree, General Brown roars in anger and hatred for the hero. Raoul tells him that he made use of his sons to create the epic masterpiece, even against their will. His words provoke General Brown, who draws his blade to strike him down. Brown questions where Raoul has kept his sons. Before Raoul is able to answer, he renders a potent slash that he casually evades, as if it were a plaything. General Brown demands Raoul to answer his question. Raoul tells him that he hasn't done much to his children, as they are still alive, and he wants to remind him of something far more important. Standing in front of the display of Brown's dead wife, Raoul questions if Brown remembers the scene of Raoul's village. Many years ago, Raoul discovered a bunch of mushrooms and reported them to his sister. Raoul remembers sharing a meal with his family. Baden Village was a small settlement at the western end of the kingdom. Raoul was born and raised in Baden Village, living a peaceful life with his family. He remembers enjoying it, even on the day of his family's demise. That day, while they were playing, a man covered in blood discovered them. He relayed to them the news of the invasion that destroyed the village. When Raoul and his sister returned, they witnessed the horrors of the burnt village. They came rushing to their mother only to discover their mother was killed. At the time, General Brown came to witness the scene and inquired if the murdered woman was a mother to the children. Raoul began to illuminate in white, and that was exactly the moment the boy's heroic powers took form. General Brown became the first person to inform him of the news and apologized to the boy for not having saved them from the demon's attack. He offered him a place at the castle in order to defeat the terrible demon king, who had led to Raoul's suffering. Raoul proceeded to live in the capital and began his training as a proper hero, not knowing that it was a path crafted by others to weave him into their belligerent schemes. Raoul remembers being fooled by their words, as they always told him it was the demons who committed atrocities. He mocks General Brown the same way, repeating his words, having uncovered that he was a malicious man. If the word despicable had a face, it would be this guy. General Brown, instead of responding maturely, becomes a psychopath and admits that he is the one who brought the end of Raoul's village, burning it down to ashes. In fact, he thrived on the thought of committing genocide under the king's direct commands. General Brown curses the hero for being a brat, 
who is revered more than him and thinks that he is the strongest in the kingdom. In order to magnify Raoul's pain, Brown decides to unpack the details of his mother's demise. He tells him that his mother was the most delightful, for protecting a village kid, begging for the boy to be spared. She wanted him to take her life if it became necessary. As a result, the man happily roasted her alive in front of the boy, and he even enjoyed having devoured her soon after. In response to his provocative story, Raoul is standing without an ounce of expression on his face. Raoul claims that he is rather bored and is already aware of the story, which is the reason he has recreated the scene, using Brown's wife. He also insults General Brown for thinking that he is the strongest and boasting it so openly. Bro is about to get packed up so hard. General Brown is riled up by his comment and shouts that the boy is just a youngster compared to the strongest. General Brown wants to bestow divine judgment upon him, while Raoul fixates his attention on his thoughts of being the strongest. He decides to entertain the general and welcomes him, wanting to break his spirit apart. Raoul relays that Brown's sons are chained in the dungeon, and he will be able to return to them if he defeats Raoul. General Brown relishes the thought of defeating Raoul and sharing the feast with his children. He initiates his attack, an attack that Raoul leisurely dodges as if he is fighting a grandma. General Brown follows up with a second strike, only for Raoul to jump on his blade without fear. Raoul toys with him by calling his attacks insignificant and slow. Every gift must be returned in kind, so he draws his blade and smiles as he swings with a predictable slash. General Brown takes the attack lightly until he feels the full might of the swing. While he is clinging for his life, Raoul tells him to try harder as he is pinned down. If your opponent is encouraging you to try harder, that's a sign you're about to get destroyed in battle. Growling in anger, General Brown releases his flames in the hopes of burning his opponent. To answer for this attack, Raoul embraces the flames and gets thrilled instead of cowering in fear. He advances forth and begins to overpower General Brown, going as far as to even encourage the general. In the aftermath of their clash, General Brown is already out of breath, while Raoul hasn't even gotten started in this battle. Brown glorifies himself as the strongest, but his words prove to be futile as Raoul hacks him with a powerful slash. Raoul is unimpressed by the strongest man while he is wasted on the ground. Raoul is impressed that Brown still wants to continue the battle despite losing so shamefully. Brown chants that he is the strongest as if that will prove his point. Raoul sits down and waits for the man to crawl to him. He encourages Brown to take the battle at his own pace. Just when he is about to reach his blade, Raoul kicks him away and sends him flying. Raoul happily shares that the general should try again. Ha ha ha, he's trolling the clown. General Brown crawls to his blade with every last bit of his strength, exhausting himself of breath. Raoul thinks that it is time for him to end things. The wasted mop on the ground asks him why he is unable to defeat Raoul, despite being the strongest. Wearing a smile, Raoul prepares his magic and shatters the general's sword, declaring that he has lost the battle to a mere brat of all people. For real, though, Bro thought he was Gojo Sadoru, only to get smoked without landing a single hit. General Brown's composure succumbs to chaos. Raoul thinks that a man who doesn't bear a sword shouldn't also have hands. He severs both from his body and claims that he has prepared a special dinner that the general will be sure to love. With the general's body cleaved in pieces, Raoul believes that they should welcome the feast. Regaining his consciousness, Brown wakes up at the same table he sat at with his family. Our lovely host, Raoul, is in proper attire as a chef and comments that Brown passed away from the pain. Brown sees his drug children, Adam and Connie, who can't move an inch from their seats. Brown questions what Raoul did to his children and calls him a swine. Raoul states that he is merely copying them, as the drug he administered to the children is the invention of his wife's family's home. He actually found it on the way when he was taking care of Adam and Connie. There, in the cells of the drugged servants, he realized that Brown's wife was taking care of them. Man, this is one messed up family and I feel scared. That's when he discovered the drug, an outrageous drug coming from a prestigious family known for producing healers in the nation. Raoul intends to pay a visit to his wife's family after he is done with them. He prepares an iron hot plate for today's feast and announces the beginning of the carnival feast. Raoul claims that their special meal for today comprises two lambs and a bull, implying the worst of things to General Brown. In fact, Raoul claims that he is interested in cutting them the freshest meat on the spot. With his blade, he first prepares a shoulder roast, wrapping it in oil and enjoying the process. With enough seasoning, Raoul finishes the roast medium rare and hopes for the general to enjoy his creation. Using his magic, Raoul forces his mouth open and shoves the meat inside. 
he is glad that General Brown didn't waste any of it, and swallowed it fully. General Brown screams in anger, calling Raoul a heretic. Raoul thinks that he hasn't done anything wrong, and is only returning the favor. For his next meal, Raoul prepared ribs, tripe, and tongue. He ensures that Brown eats every last bit of the meat. This time, he wants to entertain his sons and wonders if he should serve them bull meat. Raoul turns to Brown with a malicious smile and questions what he would like to prepare for his son. After properly tending to the meal, he feeds the boy, who enjoys the meat. Raoul finds it entertaining that the father and son are both alike. General Brown pleads, begs, and whines to spare him and his eldest son, who is the heir to the throne. Smiling at him, Raoul reminds the man that his own mother pleaded for her son's life the same way. He draws near to the murderous man and wants to ensure he remembers the horrors of the day. Confirming that he will succumb to the same fate, General Brown screams to be saved. Applause for the protagonist to serve karmic justice to these a-holes. That night, after the end of his performance, Raoul declared the end of his show. After annihilating the demons of the castle, Raoul wonders if he should play with his next victim. Bro is playing chess after being respawned, lol. Under the roof of the Pharmaceutical Research Institute lies a much deeper and darker secret. The victims are being tortured on behalf of the cruel researcher, Dr. Rin Benick. Dr. Rin likes to mutilate people's bodies and add them to her collection. She even thinks of what could transpire if she replaced a human's brain with a monkey's brain. The poor boy begs for the comfort of her mother. Rin prepares her blade and enjoys the thought of liquefying his brain. Rin is met with the military commander advisor, Lucas Eckhart, who states his purpose. Rin tells him that she's got more waste to dispose of. When Lucas inspects the mutilated bodies, his face grows a smile. They talk about the payment as Lucas is curious, while Rin tells him that she will make sure he gets paid today. When he departs, Rin reflects that Lucas only thinks about money, as such, he is a cunning man. She speaks to Lord Da Costa, who tells her that he wants to create immortal soldiers that can withstand the might of monsters without dying so easily. Rin brings forth the obvious concern that immortal soldiers would pose trouble for them. Rin tells him that they should employ a drug that slowly destroys their bodies after their enemies have been annihilated. She also thinks they should develop a cure for safety measures as well. She's out here trying to create an evil version of Captain America or some crap. Lord Da Costa finds it a brilliant idea and initiates development. His son Johans hovers over the injured soldiers and tells them that they will go to the laboratory as their beloved Dr. Benick has developed a cure that will heal any injury. The soldiers celebrate in excitement. However, when Johans runs the tests, the soldiers are reduced to monstrous cannibals. Because of the failed experiment, Rin demands more test subjects. For the second batch, they are told that volunteering for the experiment would give them a place in the noble's house. The poor children cheer in excitement as they can finally afford food to eat. Rin initiates the experiment and turns them into monsters that are quick to revert to people. She doesn't find it a satisfactory outcome and orders the next set of people. Lord Da Costa and his son prepare the third batch of children, who succumb to the unbearable pain of the drug. As their screams echo through the hall, Rin finds their strength and duration satisfactory. At last, she declares satisfaction at having created the Berserker. Rin is congratulated on her success, and the rest of the soldiers are planned to be administered the same drug. When Hero Raoul was on his mission to defeat the Demon King, many of the supply soldiers were eager to join him. However, Johans came before them and told them that they would be facing monsters, which would prove to be troublesome. For that reason, he announces that they will consume a special drug. The frantic horrors of this drug have since affected the soldiers. Now, Raoul faces the same institute and thinks that he's about to initiate another wonderful game. Lord Da Costa is in terror, having found out that his daughter's family has been killed, despite the strength of General Brown. He is frustrated, while Johan suggests his father bribe the military commander so that they can send him more soldiers. Rin doesn't show an ounce of fear and claims that they will survive with their poison, as even the hero Raoul would succumb to its effects. Johans thinks that it would be impossible to administer the dose to Hero. Rin advises Johans to use his head as if to say she has a plan. The two of them break into a quarrel, while Lucas tells them to quiet down. He wants them to think rationally. Johans claims that Lucas is so powerful, he might actually compare to a battalion of 200 soldiers. Lucas tells them about the warning letter they received from the royal capital. Gaining their attention, Lucas questions if the three are aware of the hero's revenge. Rin claims that she doesn't know, while Johans begins to realize why the hero is hunting them. His reaction is enough for Lucas to realize that there is more than what meets the eye. 
Rin roars that the hero Raul has merely gone crazy, as if to quiet down the affair. Lucas tells them that it is exactly as Rin says, as the hero Raul is ignorant of the ways of the world. Lucas is confident enough to state that Raul is not a force worth fearing, despite having become a crazy murderer. He inquires what the family did, which is so disgusting that Raul is hunting them down. Lord Doc Hosta believes that it is because of the drugs, even though they are supposed to be a top-secret experiment. Lord Da Costa questions if Lucas is actually confident in his words. Lucas counters that men like General Brown only bear brute strength, while someone like him is capable of standing against the hero. Lord Da Costa thinks that Lucas will protect them from harm, while Lucas himself looks forward to the reward. Just then, thunder roars down as a corpse splashes against the window. Lucas and the others turn to look and discover the rotten corpse of the general. His unsightly appearance terrifies the family as they beg for Lucas to get rid of him. Lucas stops them as the corpse is spouting something. The corpse announces that they have been locked inside the research facility, and as such, none of the 231 humans can leave, as only those who escape before midnight will be allowed to leave. The deceased General Brown, under the control of Raoul, declares the beginning of the game of hide and seek. Bro, I would be teleporting the fudge out of there. This is scarier than any horror movie. He offers them 10 minutes to run or hide and encourages them to fight as much as they can. Johans and Lord Da Costa are terrified, while Rin realizes that Raoul is controlling a mere corpse with magic. She smirked as if she had seen through his schemes. Lucas once again questions the family about their crimes against the hero Raoul, acknowledging the fact that Raoul only delivers karmic revenge. Lucas expects the same to happen and asks about the drugs prescribed to the soldiers, who were considered the hero's beloved allies. Bro is onto something, let him cook. Lord Da Costa confesses that they prescribed performance-enhancing drugs to the supply soldiers, and they all died as a side effect. He calls them worthless pawns, who died as insignificant losses, despite defeating the monsters in the forest. Rin claims that her drug only helped the soldiers defeat the monsters, so she thinks Rin should be thankful for it. When Lucas asks them if the drug is available at the Institute, suddenly, they all begin to realize exactly what's coming for them. Johans thinks that their estate is about to become haunted. Lucas wants them to lead the path toward the drug at once. On his way, he inquires about the word haunted that Johans described. Lord Da Costa claims that he can't reveal details of their top-secret experiment. Lucas finds it hilarious that they're capable of being stubborn, even at the 11th hour. These guys are just asking to be humbled at this point. Standing before store room number one, Rin unlocks the gate, only for them to discover a note written for the family. Rin thinks they should escape, but that's exactly when they get attacked. Rin realizes that they're trapped by dark magic. What's more, the vengeful demon is coming for their heads, and he's accompanied by the precious undead. This is officially my favorite moment so far. Tell me in the comments about yours. Raoul happily sings and greets the researchers, while he is accompanied by his assistant, General Brown. Raoul tells them that the games have begun, and orders Brown to capture them. The mummified monster unleashes its wrath upon the researchers, while Raoul insists that he calm down, since he wants them to be alive. With the researchers collected at his disposal, Raoul tells them that he's got just the role for them to fulfill. He reminds them of a certain drug that he wants them to drink. Raoul grabs the man's face and administers the drug. The second it reaches his throat, the man experiences unrelenting pain and screams in agony. His body begins to morph into a state that is an insult to humans. Raoul bears witness to the berserker, a monstrous state brought by the effects of the drug. The monster screams for his throat. Raoul recalls that all berserkers have an abnormal amount of thirst after transformation. He's also impressed by the monster's strength. Soon after, he stops the berserker from crushing a researcher's body. They think that he has saved them, but Raoul is interested in something else. Raoul declares that he wants to administer the drug to all of the researchers. After a while, he stands before the 121 monsters that he has helped create with the drug. All of them are begging to be given water, and in the act, one of them loses control and attacks General Brown. The monster's speed and strength are so powerful that it is able to crush Brown to a bloody pulp with ease. Raoul is impressed and almost pities himself for wasting a useful assistant. The reason he is shocked is that he considers General Brown to be one of the top five strongest beings in the country. It only adds proof to the drug's strength, as Raoul is led to believe that they've weaponized humans beyond control. The berserkers beg for water while Raoul embraces his little creations and welcomes them for his game. The berserkers begin to lash at him, Raoul dodges their attacks, 
and admits that the monsters are fast despite their size. He kicks one of them so hard that he knocks his head straight off. Raoul is sad that his clothes keep getting dirty. With more of the monsters rushing forth to attack him, Raoul prepares a spell and questions how it feels for the researchers to consume their little creation. He wants to play with them until the end and forms a spell that pushes them back. Raoul checks his time and realizes that five minutes are left. He knows that the researchers are nothing more than monsters. Raoul had already done the liberty of checking their wrongdoings. All of these researchers were crazed maniacs who loved sacrificing the lives of soldiers on the battlefield for their amusement. Raoul finds it ironic that the same power-hungry maniacs don't have any intellect in this state. He has peeked into their minds, the minds of the 231 researchers, who are wretched scumbags underneath. Despite being such a number, Raoul claims that not a single person had a decent soul. He remembers their elitist words and wonders if this is the true nature of human beings. Raoul doesn't really care and only looks forward to exacting his revenge. When the clock strikes the moment, the monsters experience a second, even more agonizing transformation. Raoul is joyous, basking in the glory of their pain. The drug actually comprises two transformations, separated by 10 minutes. The best part comes 15 minutes after the intake, as they are designed to self-destruct. While the berserkers are splattering their remains all over the place, Raoul is moved by hilarity and enjoys himself. My guy is having the time of his life without breaking a sweat. After they have all exploded to pieces, Raoul thinks that the situation is perfect. He remembers his precious men, who wanted to join Raoul's army and deeply admired him. While Raoul endlessly defeated the demons at the front lines to protect them, he failed to capture the true enemy, an enemy that wasn't at the front lines, but from within. This enemy brought the destruction of his men by supplying them with inhuman drugs. Raoul remembers the words of the strategists who lauded themselves as prodigies. He finds it funny that the strategists who survived because of the soldiers protecting them on the battlefield are now nothing more than a pile of dead bodies as soon as their own place turns into a battlefield. Having massacred the monsters on the first floor, Raoul wants to tend to the remaining 110 men on the second floor. After that, Raoul wishes to enjoy a medical exam on the final floor. After killing everyone on the second floor, Raoul prepares for the top floor. Now, we are shown the scene that took place at the very beginning of Lord Da Costa's family meeting. At the time, Raoul was already spying on them, to the point where he wanted to laugh in hilarity. This is because they have been waiting inside the facility for two hours, but are unaware that they have already been locked inside. Damn, he's really playing among us with these goons. Raoul implies that he has created a colorful experience for them, using his illusion magic. In the next moment, he uses his magic and manipulates General Brown's body to scare them. Raoul finds their reaction adequate and reflects that the real General Brown has already been crushed by one of the berserkers on the first floor. He is only using bits of his body and has created a mask for himself and his guys. Raoul was looking forward to their actions after the announcement of his hellish game. When Rin brought them to the storeroom for the drug, Raoul was happy to discover their faces of confusion, as he had already stolen the drug beforehand. In fact, he wasted it on the lower floors. Now that Da Costa's family is in terror, Raoul wonders who will become the first to be found. Johannes and his father think that they should escape, while Lucas argues that there are six hours to go. Johannes thinks that hiding is their safest option, while Rin suggests that they hide in a room, where the hero won't be able to find them. Rin confirms that she has such a room for them. Johannes and Lord Da Costa begin to calm down, while Rin internalizes that they're all idiots for not recognizing the signs. Strangely, she offers them coffee on this occasion. Rin brews them coffee and becomes glad of their idiocy because she is planning to use them as her chance to escape. She brings them coffee to enjoy. Lord Da Costa and Johannes are the first ones to reach for the coffee. The two of them consume it at once, while Lucas requests Dr. Rin to stop for a moment. He offers them to exchange the cups. Rin wonders why he is saying such a thing. Lucas argues that they're standing inside a facility that has a drug capable of changing people into monsters. He further asserts that she could very well be trying to drug them into becoming monsters to fight their enemy. Yo, this guy is actually cooking. Interestingly, Rin tells him that Lucas should have stopped her sooner, claiming that she didn't put poison in both of their cups. Lucas tries to apprehend her, but Rin is smart and claims that he should be the one to stop his act. Rin reveals that they have been fooled since the beginning, and she calls into question Lucas' information about the hero's revenge pattern. She states that the royal capital didn't mention any information, 
and that he seems to be the only person who knows about intricate details. Rin calls him a fool for being unable to act like the real Lucas, and declares that this man is actually the hero Raul. My guy was the imposter all along. What a grand reveal. Rin latches to the thought of victory, believing that she has outsmarted him in this battle. Lucas, no, Raul claps for her achievement, and congratulates Dr. Rin Benick for the accomplishment. Not because she succeeded, but because he was getting bored, nobody would be able to catch his hints. Imagine being so good, that you have to drop hints for them to catch you, a master manipulator. 